Is approaching the pelvic floor first the best solution for chronic pelvic pain? Join us in this episode for part one of two to hear a thought-provoking conversation with Michelle Lyons on polyvagal theory and its importance with regards to treating clients with chronic pelvic pain and trauma. Hello, friends. This is Lynn Schulte, and you are listening to the Birth Healing Summit podcast. We are here for meaningful conversations that will transform the way you work with pregnant and postpartum clients. Whether it is a new perspective, tool, or technique, you'll be able to implement it in to your practice today. I invite you to sit back, listen with an open mind, and grab the golden nugget today's guest has to offer. Now let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this podcast episode. I am so excited for our conversation today with Michelle Lyons. Michelle is a physiotherapist in Ireland. She is an educator um, and helps spread the word all on women's health to all those that that are lucky enough to, to work with her. Um, I actually took, you gave a talk uh, or a, a class on um, special interests uh, for the women's health section of the APTA. And I took that course years ago and I loved it. Um, it was on endo. What were the other <laughs> special topics, Michelle? So I, I think it was endometriosis, um, interstitial cystitis, and pudendal neuralgia, the evil triplets of pelvic pain. Oh, it was so good. It was so good. Michelle. Oh, thank you. Well, welcome to the this episode, Michelle. Thanks so much for being here. Now, the other thing that I wanted to introduce you about you is that you actually, your business name is Celebrate Mulebrity. Mulebrity. Yes. Good work. <laughs> yes. Tell us about that. What does that mean? So it's an old English word and it means the art and state of being a woman. And I think we should celebrate that. So it's as simple and as complex as that. <laughs> do, you, do you get people going, what is that? Every that? day, Lynn, every day. <laughs> what does that mean? But then I explain it and then I could, oh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> and, and people are like, amen, sister. That's awesome. Let's do Absolutely. That. Absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Well, Michelle, um, I was also present this year at a uh, combined sections meeting of the APTA. And you gave an amazing talk. Oh. And um, I I had to re restrain myself from like standing up and giving you a standing ovation because, you know, you said something that just is near and dear to my heart. Um, and, and that was, you know, you were talking about trauma and um, what was it, a movement-based um, approach yeah, to using, trauma? Using was movement, it? you know, to help your patients get through pain and trauma um, and really evolving our approach to, to helping people who are dealing with particularly I think persistent pelvic pain yeah. um, and I think I know what I said that got your attention I'm going to guess and see yes. if my memory serves me right I may have said that going straight to an internal pelvic uh, strategy was possibly not the best way to go for these people with this issue absolutely and, and, and I did, I think I kind of raised my hands up over my head, but I wanted I saw you. to stand up and go, amen, sister, amen. Yeah. Yes, because these, these, these clients that come to us that are in that chronic pain or, or, or just have, have trauma. Sometimes there's not a lot of, usually there is pain with trauma, but sometimes there's not, but the body and it, the system whether, whether it's in the tissues or in the nervous system, it doesn't matter, people. No. It is the state of the being in front of us that we as physical therapists or we as body workers need to be able to read. Yes. 100%. No, when there is when this system is activated mm -hmm. and when this system is okay for doing intravaginal work. So Thank you. Thank you for saying those words. And I hope everybody, you know what, damn it. I wish I would have stood up and give you a standing up. <laughs> you really made a point. You're very kind. You're very kind. No, I think it's really important, Lynn, because, you know, we talk about in our profession um, and, you know, I wear a couple of different hats, you know, um, I graduated as, as a physio nearly 30 years ago. I've done a postgrad in health coaching, which really transformed how I interact 
with the world um, and nutrition and yoga and Pilates and all, all that good stuff. And it all comes together. But I think we have to remember that we're dealing with people that, you know, there is a person attached to that vagina that we're, we're working with. Um, and to really, you know, emphasize the shift in, in, in moving from a, a very biomedical model that, you know, a lot of us elder lemons were, were educated through um, with the issue in the tissues. And what we're learning more and more now is that we really have to embrace all of the research that supports a biopsychosocial approach. Um, that we treat body, mind, spirit, but also, you know, taking into account the social, the cultural considerations as well. Um, and that really has to look at everything from movement, from nutrition, from sleep, from stress management. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the key questions that I ask people is, you know, so what do you do for fun? And it's really, it's worrying how hard a question that is for, for a lot of folks, particularly those who are dealing with persistent pain. And I'd say particularly, particularly if it's persistent pelvic pain. So it's being able to really establish that connection with people. And over the past couple of years, I've really been nerding hard on the vagus and polyvagal theory and how those can really influence um, our journey as pelvic health aficionados and and really just doing the best for the people that we serve yeah so what is it that we need to know about this polyvagal theory and um to, to help us how can that information guide us as we're working with our clients sure okay so i think maybe a good starting point would be to the difference between say the vagus nerve which is a physical structure we've got two vagus nerves in our bodies it's the 10th cranial nerve um, and then we can talk about how that's influenced the development of polyvagal theory. And I do just want to emphasize it is a theory. Um, we all know what can happen to theories, as I'm, <laughs> as I'm fond of saying. But it's a it's a nice framework, um, I think, you know, and it can suit our evolving paradigm of pelvic pain treatment. So the vagus nerve, 10th cranial nerve coming out from from the brain and traveling down the side of the neck sending branches to the larynx and the pharynx um, and the, the ear as well. As it goes down through the neck into the thorax, it's got branches going to the heart, to the lungs, travels underneath the diaphragm then and literally sending branches everywhere, the stomach, the small intestine, the adrenals, the kidneys, down as far as the uterus, down as far as the splenic flexure of the large intestine. So it's really got its fingers in a lot of different pies. And it's the mainstay of our parasympathetic nervous system. So we might think of the parasympathetic nervous system as our rest and digest. It's our, the calming part of our autonomic nervous system. But the vagus nerve is, it's the big player in the parasympathetic nervous system. But what's really interesting about the vagus is that 80% of the fibers of vagus are going from the gut up to the brain. So it's often called an information superhighway between the gut and the brain. And it's really the basis of much of what we know about the gut brain axis. So we talk about having gut feelings or, you know, butterflies in our tummy if we're nervous. You know, yeah. most of us will have some sort of bowel or we're stressed. Some people get very constipated. Other people get diarrhea when they're persistently stressed. Yeah. Yeah. But 80% of those messages are going from the, the gut up to the brain. And then 20% of the vagus is bringing messages from the brain back down to the gut again. So that's really what's happening with the vagus nerve. Polyvagal theory, on the other hand, has connections to the vagus nerve. But it was developed, oh gosh, over 20 years ago by Stephen Porges. Mm -hmm. And he talks about maybe just evolving our understanding of sympathetic versus parasympathetic, you know, fight or flight versus rest and digest, which he says is a little too simplistic. So he talks about how we have three states of being. And the first one is when we're in a ventral vagal state. And this is where we feel safe. We feel grounded. We feel in control of our environment. We feel open and communicative. And we're making eye contact or is low, is low, it's soft, our breathing is relaxed, all is right with the world. But then a stressor comes along and we move into the sympathetic 
fight or flight phase. You know, our stress hormones get released, cortisol, adrenaline, muscle tension. Our breathing maybe becomes a little bit shallow. The pelvic floor tightens up, as can the upper traps as part of our stress response. And if that stress exposure persists, then we can move into a dorsal vagal state. And this is really where we're moving into that freeze state. We just withdraw. We stop caring. We stop engaging with the outside world. We just, our world can start to close in on us. And we just, we, everything just feels big and scary or just blah, you know, and we're really, we don't have any joy in our lives anymore. Um, and what's really interesting, I think, for us in, you know, the healthy movement space is what Poor just talks about is the way back from a dorsal vagal withdrawn, frozen state, the way back to being in a ventral state is actually we've got to move through that sympathetic state to get back to ventral state. And the best way to do that is movement and safe movement and movement where we can actually start to rebuild the relationship with our body again. Um, and good gut health, you know, would be a big part of that as well. But we can use breath work, we can use optimizing our gut, but movement is just fundamental to being in our bodies, being at peace with our bodies. And then that allows us to be at peace with the outside world again. So Michelle, what's coming to mind to me is you were talking about that dorsal vagal response is mm. as you were talking about that withdrawal, I've just seen as, as you're scrolling through social media, you're on Instagram and you're just, you know, scrolling through and you can see, I'm, I look at a lot of birth pictures and videos, right? And you can just see a mom's reaction when when she's just kind of like turned away she's in the bed and she's just withdrawn like like you were yeah. just driving there and mm -hmm. and then they get stuck there and i yes. wonder how many of those those women then go on to um develop uh postpartum depression absolutely or ptsd ptsd you know absolutely because i think that's that's a really important point because it is so easy to get stuck there. And I know, you know, you and I have talked previously about the effect then of hormonal changes in that postnatal period. And if you're postnatal and perimenopausal and breastfeeding all at the same time, all the issues that can come about because of that. But I think that trauma response is really something that's been underregarded for yeah. a long time. And, you know, I think if we actually look we, you know, we've we've grown up a lot in terms of how we regard pain. You know, the International Association for the Study of Pain a couple of years ago redefined what pain was. And they talk about how it's a sensory and emotional experience mm -hmm. um, in response to actual or potential tissue damage. Uh -huh. What's unfortunate is if you look at the DSM-5 definition of trauma, though, they basically say that unless it's life threatening, it doesn't count as trauma. Oh, we need a different word, don't we, Michelle? I well, we do, or or we could take back trauma and just really acknowledge what what folks are actually going through. Because you know, if you look at at what we talk about with pain, you know, we 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 say that pain is whatever you say it is. It's a very subjective, personal experience, and I think trauma is a bit like that as well. Um, you know. Any experience of, of violence or victimization, mm -hmm. you know, as you interpret it, who, who are we to say, well, that doesn't count? You right. know, who, who is it to say that an episiotomy for, for one person or a C-section, you know, if they planned a, a vaginal birth, you know, who are we to say, well, that, that's not real trauma? You know, right. and yeah. I think we have to be super respectful of people's interpretation because we don't know what they're bringing to the table, maybe in terms of adverse childhood events, you know, yes. current living circumstances, but just their own perceptions and their own reality. So yeah. I think we have to be really aware of, of what trauma is for, for anybody that we're working with. Absolutely. And so, Michelle, I want to go there. How do you, in the clinic, working with your clients coming in, how do you sense or know someone has trauma or has been traumatized? Well, I think there, there's there's kind of a soft answer and a hard answer to that. And I think, you know, kind of the soft answer would be 
I think some of it comes with experience, experience of working with human beings. You know, yeah. you can pick up if somebody's having difficulty making eye contact with you or you're asking them questions about about pelvic health, about their general health and their voice is is low. They're hesitant. Their you know, their posture is quite withdrawn, you know, and you really have to work on on building that therapeutic alliance and coming from a place of trust and cooperation. So, for example, like creating a, a safe environment for your your clinical setting is absolutely vital. No harsh fluorescent overhead lights, no loud music, things like that. From a more objective perspective, we can use things like the central sensitization inventory. We can use things like the depression, anxiety, severity scale. We can use things like the, um, you know, the PCS if we're, if we're trying to screen for catastrophization. And those are all great validated measures as well, if we're looking for some hard data. Mm -hmm. But on a human level, I think if you are used to working with people in pain, um, you, you can pick up those cues from their demeanor, from, like I said, from their, their, the tone of voice that they're using while they're talking to you. And it's, it's kind of like dealing with, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with horses, for example, if, if you have a horse who's a little bit spooky, a little bit flighty, you don't just march straight up to it head on and look it in the eyes because it's going to be gone. You know, you yes. have to kind of, you know, keep your eyes and your voice soft and low and you kind of sidle up to it sideways and you make sure that it has a sense of you before you put your hands on it and i think humans can be like that as well we have mm -hmm. to be really just gentle in our approach with everybody and honestly at this point you know a, a lot of the work that i do is is also in in the cancer realm particularly in pelvic oncology so trauma for me is implied in in those scenarios as well i i assume trauma until proven otherwise <laughs> and it's generally it's an approach yeah. that i carry over with everybody that yeah. i see because yeah. you know we've all got baggage absolutely and um one of the things my girlfriend who is a doctor um was she was showing me her new her clinic and everything and and she happened to um just talk about the way she has her chair and the the her patient's chair and mm -hmm. that they're not meant to be face to face, yes. that she actually does it at a 45 degree angle so I that she's not looking face on with someone. So that's something as practitioners we can keep in mind for our clients that if you can set up your room yes. in a way where you're kind of like you, like the horse coming at them from the side versus yeah. head on, yeah. that can and be it kind of. I think that can really kind of co-create the sense of, you know, we're, we're in this together, yes. you know, uh, we're going to work together because yeah. what we to come across as mechanics coming into, um, and that's why kind of doing that postgrad and health coaching a couple of years ago, really, again, changed my perspective, acknowledging that each person is the expert on themselves mm -hmm. and what do is coax you know a strategy that they're comfortable with that's going to work for them and and really just allowing them to set the tone to set the pace and then we can offer support and strategies along the way but instead of getting super excited and bringing in this kind of high energy yes I know what it is I know how to fix you it's yeah. you know and what do you think so you know there's a couple of really um interesting things that we can do to tap into that polyvalent uh, approach because what what embodying a polyvagal approach to to patient care actually means is that it's our responsibility to set the tone uh, so, so it's our voice you know it's yeah. our eye contact it's the environment that we've created and yeah. um, are we creating a safe space it's also our you know i hate to use the word but it's our energy too it's, yeah, 100%. It's, it's the, you know, what is our nervous system doing? Because we are co-regulating with our patients yes. and we need to have that sense of calmness and groundedness mm -hmm. within us so that mm -hmm. we can help, you know, we are the mom to the baby, 
to yes. our patients. You know, moms yeah. are meant to co-regulate the baby and be that grounded, centered source for a baby to exactly. calm down too. And as therapists, we need to do the same for our clients as well. And that's why it is so important, especially anyone working in this pelvic health arena, you have to have an understanding of trauma. Just like you said, with all your cancer patients, you're just assuming trauma and less proven otherwise. I love that statement. Yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, and in birth, I can't say that we should have that overarching umbrella, but I think we should have a greater awareness towards that, right? That, you know, not all Absolutely. births go smoothly and there is that potential for trauma and we need to be aware of yeah. helping to ground ourselves, calm ourselves down so we can be that resonance for our clients. And that's why, Michelle, if I personally find that it's so important for us as therapists to do our own work. Yes. <laughs> if, we are, if we are traumatized from our own births, there's a, you know, it's just going to be a little bit more challenging for you to work with someone else who's traumatized as well. And so, yeah. um, you know, that's why my advanced body of work is meant to is designed to help people do their own work so that we can show up more powerfully, more grounded for our clients. And well, absolutely. Because if you're getting triggered every time, yes. a, a, you know, a, a particular client comes up, what's the energy that you're projecting into the relationship then as well? And how objective can you be about helping that person without kind of, you know, looking at it through the lens of your own history? Yeah, yeah, it's so, so important. And I think we also have to, you know, we really, yeah, we have to, you know, also really be quite clear that self-care is not bubble baths. I mean, like, you know, if you like bubble baths, that's great. But yeah. self-care actually means taking proper care of yourself as a healthcare provider. Because if you, you know, you, it's such a cliche, but you literally cannot pour from an empty cup. And yeah. particularly in pelvic health, where, you know, it's such a sensitive Yes. emotive area um we really have to be very conscious of the energy that we're bringing into the conversation into the room you know are we do we have the capability you know as we wash our hands between clients you know can we shake off yes. and come in with fresh eyes because the next person that you see might be the sixth or seventh or hopefully not the eighth person you've seen that day but for some people it might be but for them it's their first pelvic health appointment maybe of the day and so you want to be sure that you're coming in with clear eyes. Um, oh, what was that? There was, a, there was a TV show about football. Um, clear eyes, full heart, can't lose. Um, <laughs> Friday Night Lights. Friday Night go. Lights. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. But that's the sort of energy maybe that we should think about bringing in to each encounter, you know, mm -hmm. and that, but then also what I think is super, super important for us as healthcare providers, can we leave all of that behind at the end of the day? Amen. And that's the, P that's the PhD level. Yes. Yes. Well, and it, and it's funny because I find that as practitioners, there's a couple of imprints that I have found in people. Um, we all have that. I need to save the world. I shouldn't say we all, I can't generalize that. Um, however, I do find that a large majority of healthcare practitioners have what I call this imprint of that I must save the world, you know, yes. and, and it doesn't allow us to, you know, we're taking on the responsibility of everybody else's healing. And that's draining, yes. Michelle, that's not sustainable, not healthy for us as practitioners. No, so, and it's, it's not, and I think it's particularly relevant I'd say rampant in pelvic health because for for so many of the people that we're working with we we may be hearing you are the first person to believe me you are the first person to reproduce my symptoms you are the first person to help me and the emotional outpouring that can come along with that it's a loss yes. it's a loss and we can guess you know we can get swept up in this wave of trying to be all things to all people mm -hmm. and, you know, really kind of shepherding them and advocating for them at, at what cost to our own health as well. And it's, it's to really, it's, it's something that I say to, to a lot of young, uh, younger women's healthcare professionals as well, that boundaries are really important. And, you know, 
can you can you leave your work behind at the end of the day and what are you doing to fill yourself up again before you go back into that situation yeah that's amazing what what do you recommend michelle for that filling up it has to be whatever brings you joy i mean for me it's i uh, i love historical fiction you know i'm a danger in a bookshop um <laughs> unsupervised um so like that that for me is bliss you know going to bed early cup of tea good book you know yeah. but yeah. having some sort of movement practice i think is really important as well so whether that's yoga or pilates or dance or whatever you like doing yeah getting yeah. outside in nature you know but even something as simple as how are you sleeping yeah. You know, sleep is just fundamental. And there are so many of us are sleep deprived. You know, maybe we're at different phases of our. It's maybe we're caretaking for older parents mm -hmm. and sleep is just such a good barometer and influencer of everything else. So, you know, are you sleeping well? Are you eating well? Are you moving your body? And um, I think getting those big rocks in place first, then we can we can add on other layers. And like I said, if you like bubble baths, absolutely go for it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's 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 important that we kind of look beyond you know something yeah. fluffy and superficial like that you know michelle i have to i have to be um uh what what's the word here i'm gonna reveal a little bit about myself here i i grew up when in a family where we my dad watched tv every night right and so that was that's how you calm down at night and that's you know we watched a few hours of tv and then we went to bed and that is still my mo today and um, I had some friends staying with me for a couple of weeks and they, you know, I didn't do that. I didn't get to, because I was, we were entertaining and talking and we had a great time. However, I realized that I was actually feeling more depleted because I wasn't doing, and, and, you know, I'm thinking, oh, TV is so bad. I'm checking out, you know, and I, that was the guilt that I was putting on myself. Oh. But then I realize I'm like, oh my God, that actually recenters me. That yes. calms me. That, you know, like that calms me down. And that is Thanks. my joy. I love binging <laughs> a show yes. or whatever it is, you know? And so I, oh, I realize that that's what I need. I yep. need to do that. And so I've I've owned that more. But Good. I also want to say for those therapists that are younger moms. I don't know about you, Michelle, but Michelle and I both have same age kiddos here mm -hmm. and they're in their twenties. And I don't know about you, but when they were younger, I kind of gave up all the things that I love doing. And, and it's just now recently that I've gotten back into playing tennis and, you know, doing some of the things that I love. Right. And yeah. I want to just put this out there for you, younger moms, do not do that. <laughs> Yeah, don't be like us. Don't be like <laughs> Learn us. from our mistakes. <laughs> yes, please do the things that may bring you joy. And and you know, like I wish I would have continued to play tennis throughout while I was raising my kiddos. I wish I would have skied more. You know, like I look back and go, wow, I just gave all that up. And yeah, but you know, I I think you know, with different seasons come different challenges. Um, and I, I don't know about you, Lynn, but didn't you feel like when you turned 40, somebody just flipped a switch? Yes. And you yeah. realize, oh, hang on. <laughs> I matter too. Yes. <laughs> I, I should be on the list. <laughs> yes. So 40s was the start of it. But man, yeah. the 50s. Oh, boy, sister. That is when you just the 50s are the best, I have to say. I just turned 50 in December. And so far I would have to say, yes, <laughs> the best. Okay. I'm only I'm three months in, but so far so good. Well, uh, it, the, in your fifties, um, from my experience, you just don't give a flying flip about anything or anyone else's yeah. opinion or anything. It's so liberating. It is. It so is. Oh my gosh. Okay. So young, young women's health pros out there, stay the course. Yes. <laughs> but but put yourself on the list. You know, I was, I was listening to a podcast this morning while I was driving over and I think it was, it was Mel Robbins that I was listening to. And she was talking about exactly this, how important it is for young mothers 
um, to maybe you know reach out if you haven't got you know the support of a of a partner or family, like reach out to other mums you know in your neighborhood and and swap play dates you know try and find something that puts energy into your system again yes. um, and it just makes you know and everybody feels very overwhelmed in that time period when you have small children and you you hear you know oh you should do something else as well and it's like oh how could i possibly yeah. but if it's something else that gives you joy it's super important and particularly if you are a healthcare professional if you are working with women in pain or distress, yeah. you, you know, as I said, you just, you cannot pour from an empty cup and to carry that metaphor a little bit further. And I don't remember who to give credit to this for, um, but this speaker, it was a Ted talk I was listening to years ago. And she talked about how, you know, the, the, the metaphor really is, you know, you, you can't pour from an empty cup. So you fill your cup first before you fill everybody else's cup, but she took it one bit further and filling your own cup so that it overflows into the saucer. And what's in the saucer is for everybody else. The full cup is for you. I so love that. They get the excess, but you've got to look after yourself first. Amen to that, Michelle. Amen. That is so important. We should only be giving from the overflow. I yes. love that. Oh my gosh. And that is such a great um, point for us to end this episode on. And Michelle, what I would love to do, if you have more time, I'd love to do a part two to this talk, because I think we need to dive into more of that movement and what, what really, how does that really impact the trauma response in the body? That's where I would I'd love, love to, to dive dive deeper in with you. And Michelle also made a point about, um, you were talking about the uh, postmenopause or postnatal and postmenopausal women and talking about the hormonal influence. And Michelle gave an interview at the Birth Healing Summit this year. And so you guys can um, check out the Birth Healing Summit um, and maybe purchase the, the all access pass so you can listen into that interview if you missed it. Um, and so I just wanted to give a shout out for that. Thank you for doing that, Michelle. And um, it was so much fun talking to you about that. And I can't wait for the next episode where we can dive into deeper and talking more about how to do the movement-based um, approach to working with trauma. Okay. Does that sound like a plan, Michelle? Okay. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for listening into this episode. And here is to smoother bursts and faster recoveries. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Today's podcast was brought to you by the Institute for Birth Healing. To discover more, visit instituteforbirthhealing.com. To claim $50 off of any online course, use coupon code PODCAST50 at checkout. Till next time, I'm Lynn Schulte, founder of the Institute for Birth Healing.